Uh, first of all, let me thank the Columbus Stock Exchange uh, for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, I have been asked to talk about the different aspects of wealth management. Now, the reality is, once you do a listing, uh, for example, if it's an offer for sale, you're going to end up with a pot of cash. Now, the question is, what do you do with that pot of cash? Chances are, you're going to field a lot of phone calls. You may already be doing that from fund managers like ourselves, from your bankers, from different stockbrokers, asking you and offering you a whole host of different investment opportunities. The easiest thing to do is to actually give a little bit of funds to different people to manage and basically taking a, a, a bit of a piecemeal approach. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the right approach. And what I hope to do this evening is hopefully to talk you through a bit of a framework of how you should uh, think about your wealth and how you should manage uh, your wealth going forward. Deshan's already stolen my thunder by putting the uh, similar slide in his presentation, but the fact that both of us are saying the same thing, perhaps there is some value in this. And the reality is that, uh, you know, shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves, the first generation builds a business, the second generation may grow the business, and by the time you come to the fourth generation, you may have lost a lot of your wealth. The reality is about 10% of private businesses don't actually make it into the next, uh, by, to the fourth generation. Now, why is that important? Um, a large component of your wealth is probably tied to your private business. Now, I don't actually have the data for Sri Lanka. This is data from uh, what Edelweiss has done for India. And what they found was, if you look at Indian families, roughly about 42% of their wealth is actually tied to their family businesses, their operating assets. Then you have some investments in real estate. Uh, financial investments is basically your investments in deposits, your stock market investments, your bond market investments, etc. Now, if you are a first generation business, the chances are your operating business, your family business is going to be a larger chunk of that pie. As you go on to the second generation, as you go on to the third generation, uh, your the hope is that your operating business, your family business, would have been able to generate you sufficient income that you could have actually diversified your portfolio into other investments, whether it's real estate or whether it's financial investments. So thinking about your wealth, thinking about how to manage the wealth, is very, it's a very important thing. So the question is, how do you ensure that you don't fall into that 10%? that how do you ensure that you don't fall into the 90%? How do you ensure that you're actually in that 10% that is able to sustain your wealth to multiple generations? So what I want to do this evening is to give you a brief framework of how you should think about it. So two questions one needs to ask is, how should I think about my family wealth? And second thing is, how should I actually manage my family wealth? So in, in terms of a broad framework, um, this is one way of doing it. This is perhaps not the only way of doing it. Uh, there may be better ways of doing it, but this is a framework that we use internally, and we found that this to be quite useful when we engage our clients. Before you do anything, the first thing that one needs to do is to look at your existing assets. Ask yourself a very fundamental question. What is my wealth? Now, that may sound like a very simple question. If I were to ask you, what is your net worth, chances are quite a few of you will find that question a little bit difficult to answer. You may have your investments in the form of your business assets. You may have investments in the equity markets, in the bond markets, in deposits. So the first picture, first thing to do is basically to think about the composition of your assets. And in a country like Sri Lanka, where we don't have many complex products, chances are you will have your business. If you go for an IPO, you may have some IPO proceeds. You'll have investments in listed equities, fixed income, real estate, and ultimately, just like that pie chart I showed you earlier, you will have some composition of your wealth. So the question one needs to ask is, is that composition of wealth optimal for what you want to do? So that brings you on to the second step. The second step is to think about what is it that you really want to do with your wealth? And we are talking about what is it that you want to do with your wealth over successive generations. You know, what is the purpose of your wealth? So this is where, and this is a very critical step in this whole process. Now, this is not something, for the first step, you could probably get third parties to come and help you do that. 
But this is something that you need to sit down, uh, as Deshaun alluded to as well, with your family members, with your stakeholders, and ask that fundamental question, over the next three, four, five generations, what is it that we really want to do with our wealth? And in order to do this, uh, a very basic framework uh, we think we, we use to help our clients is to look at <clears throat> the goals and objectives across four very broad spectrums, or four very broad areas, right? Because if you think about your goals and objectives, a lot of these will have some element of cost associated with it. So the question then becomes, how does one plan for that? First thing you think about is on your consumption side. Now, this is the, perhaps the easiest one to look at. This is your living expenses. How do you fund your children's education? Uh, how do you think about you know, buying assets for your children, etc.? The second one, and this is something that I think a lot of people do, a lot of people think about. The second one becomes very critical, and that is your intergenerational wealth transfer. How do you transfer your assets? How do you transfer your businesses to the next generation? And this is where it's important to think about the structure that you use. You could have family councils, you could have a family constitution, as like Deshan said, you can have a family holding company, which is the one that holds the asset that you're actually going to list on the, on the stock exchange. But ultimately, a lot of this boils down to sitting down and thinking about was it, what is it that you and your family want to do with your wealth? How do you transfer that wealth to your gen next generation? Obviously, if, if, you're, if you just have one kid, the equation is much easier. If you have multiple children, then the equation gets a little bit more complicated. If you have children that don't want to be involved in your business because they feel that your business is not hip enough, then your problems are become even more complicated. Um, so this is a very critical aspect. How do you think about the transfer of your assets? Then you think about your philanthropy. As your wealth increases, um, We'll want to think about your philanthropy. How do you do it? Do you set up a charitable trust? Do you actually give directly to charities? How do you do that? How do you monitor that? And finally, what is your legacy? I mean, you, you build this wealth. You've done well for yourself. How do you want to be remembered? Now, for some people, that may be setting up a foundation. You know, in the case of Bill and Melinda Gates, they have their foundation that funds all sorts of different research. For some people, it may be setting up um, something to do with your passions. It could be setting up um, uh, some sort of an art collection or it could be a museum, whatever it is, right? What is your legacy? What do you want to be remembered for? And if you look at the picture of your wealth, for, for a large pop percentage of the population, you know, as your wealth increases, the complexity in terms of managing and thinking about your wealth unfortunately increases, right? For a large percentage of the population, you know, are, the main thing that they're thinking about is the consumption. How do I fund my kids' education? How do I fund my living expenses? As your wealth increases, then you start thinking about the assets that you want to transfer to your next generation. Then you start thinking about your charity. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have your legacy. Right? And what you'll probably find is as your wealth increases, the percentage of your wealth that you allocate to these four buckets will vary dramatically. At the far end of the spectrum, perhaps a larger chunk of your wealth will go into your legacy, into your legacy project. So this is a very, 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 very basic framework that we use to, to help people think about uh, how to manage, how to think about the wealth. So the next step, you've looked at your current wealth picture, you've had those difficult conversations, you sat around the table, you sat around the family table, you talked about your objectives, you got your family constitution in play, you got your family structure in play, you put your governance structures in play. Then the next question one needs to ask herself is, how do I now structure my assets so that my objectives can be met? Okay. Now, this is where the technical part of the whole analysis comes into play. The, real ob the goal here is to ensure that your assets can give you sufficient returns so that your objectives can be met. And when you're doing this, it's important to realize that amongst your collection of assets, you may have assets that generate an income, and at the same time, you may have assets that do not generate an income, right? Some of you may have collections, antiques, paintings, cars, whatever it is. Those are there for your hobby. They are part of your wealth, 
but they are not actually going to give you a return. They may not help you with some of the objectives that you have. Other thing to remember is, in order to meet your objectives, there will be certain return targets that you need to hit. So the first question one needs to ask is, are those return targets realistic? And if those return targets are realistic, how should I then compose? What should, what should that allocation of my assets be? Or what should my pie chart look like so that my objectives can be met? Now, there is no magic bullet here. Uh, what we found is that there is no magic asset allocation that works for everyone. Uh, because people's needs are different, because people's requirements are different, their circumstances are different, the, the long-term asset allocation that um, will suit you will be different as well. And the other important thing to look at is, when you're doing this type of analysis, when you're thinking about this, is to realize that these allocations or the composition of your assets should vary depending on the economic evolutions of the country. Finally, how should you manage your wealth? Again, what we see is a lot of people make the mistake of taking a piecemeal approach. They will give a little bit to A, a little bit to B, put some money there. You know, people come with fantastic ideas in terms of this investment versus that investment. You know, it's a very piecemeal approach. So the key thing that I want to think about here is you need to institutionalize the process in which you actually make your investments. You need to institutionalize a process in which you manage your wealth. There's no point in doing all the previous steps. There's no point in putting all these constitutions in place. There's no point in um, putting the governance structures in place if you don't have a proper way of managing your wealth. Um, so when you think about managing your wealth, there are different facets that uh, one can think of. Uh, this is basically from a survey that was done by INSEAD and Pictet. And they've looked at uh, family officers across the region, and they try to map out the different type of families and how they approach management of their wealth. And when you think about management of their wealth, um, we can talk about diversification of your investments, you can talk about risk management, the cost of managing uh, expenses. Do you do it in-house? Do you outsource? How much do you do in-house? How much do you outsource? How much family control should you have? And ultimately, what is the governance structure that you need to think of? So if you are a, let's say you're a first generation family, you're probably in that red line. That is what's known as a nascent uh, family office, where you have very tight family control. The patriarch or the matriarch of the family is probably making all the investment decisions. Um, the kids may not have a say, right? So you're there's not much diversification because a large component of your assets may be tied to your family business, which also means that there is very limited risk management. If something were to happen to your family business, your family wealth is at risk. Um, the cost of managing the investments is probably low because it's you making the investments perhaps with your finance team. But ultimately, and the governance structure, not much of a governance structure either, it's one or two people making the decisions. On the other end of the spectrum, as you go towards the second generation to the third generation or the fourth generation, you can even do this in the first generation, you start institutionalizing the management of your wealth. What does that mean? You start bringing in people from outside. You start bringing in external managers, you start bringing um, third parties, perhaps third parties, or you may do it yourself. Key thing here is that you start putting the governance structures in place. You, you think about your investment policy statements, you think about what your wealth composition should look like, and you're taking more of a structured approach to managing your wealth. So immediately you're putting a governance structure in place. And with that in play, your portfolio suddenly starts becoming diversified. So you're no longer running the risk of having all your eggs in one basket. You have a diversified portfolio, along with that you perhaps you have better risk management. And by risk management, I'm not just talking about market risk, I'm also talking about operational risks. If you're doing everything yourself with a small team um, versus having an institutionalized process means that you're actually gonna put processes in place to ensure that operational risk is also covered. The flip side, obviously, is that your expenses will be higher. The moment you start institutionalizing it, your costs may be higher because you will be perhaps hiring external parties to manage it. You may be hiring your own staff to manage it. But the advantage there is that you now have uh, a set of diversified investments, 
And what that hopefully means is that your returns over a long period of time are going to be a lot more predictable. They are not going to be volatile. The risk that you run in the red line is that when you have very tight control, when you have your assets are very much concentrated in a few investments, you run the risk of very volatile uh, returns. So, you know, a question that a lot of people ask is, you know, should I look at a family office structure? So what is a, what is a family office? Family offices are not new. Um, one of the first family offices was started by Rockefeller back in the 18, 1800s. He started this to manage his own family's wealth. And over the last, I guess, 100 plus years, it has evolved into managing other families' wealth as well. So in terms of managing your wealth, you know, two broad approaches that you can use. You can decide to do it yourself. You set up your own family office that does this for you. Uh, that's what's known as a single family office that manages the wealth of a single family. Or you can use multifamily offices, organizations that manage investments of, of multiple families. Globally, about 80% of family assets are managed by single family officers, and 20% are managed by multifamily officers. Uh, ultimately, it boils down to cost. If your wealth is off at a certain level, it perhaps makes sense for you to have your own family office. But at a certain level, it may make sense for you to have uh, use, use a third party multifamily office. And what do these multifamily officers do? Um, pretty much everything, including taking your dog for a walk. Um, you know, starting with the wealth management aspect of it. This is what I talked about, think, helping you think about your long-term goals, your objectives, helping you think about your investment policy statements, thinking about how you transfer your wealth to the successive generations, thinking, thinking about or helping you think about what you do with your family business. Then on the other hand, you have the fund management aspect of it. You know, you could manage the funds yourself, or you can use third party managers. You can select third party managers to do this for you. Coordinating with uh, tax consultants, et cetera, on your taxes to ensure that everything is legit. And also helping with your philanthropy, helping with your legacy, helping you set up those trusts or look at your, the philanthropic aspects that you want to do. And that pretty much is, you know, if you're looking at a family office structure, and that's pretty much a kind of structure that one tends to look at uh, in, in terms of managing your wealth. So the key here is that you are now institutionalizing the management of your wealth. So uh, finally, I mean, if there is one key takeaway uh, I would like you all to take from my presentation this evening is that please, 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 please don't take a piecemeal approach to managing your wealth. Remember, 90% of family businesses, family wealth is lost by the third generation. Don't be in that 90%. Try to be in that 10%. As Deshan said, think about an IPO is a fantastic way for you to ensure longevity of your family business. Along with that, think about how you ensure that your family wealth is also goes on to successive generations. Take a more structured approach to uh, managing your wealth. Think about your objectives. Think about what you want to do with your wealth. Think about get, get the buy-in from your family members. It's, you know, it's no point putting your family structures in play just so that the second generation can come and actually change it. So make sure that you put the constitutions, accept everything in play. And finally, have a structured approach to manage your wealth. Ultimately, you all worked hard to get here. Let's not, let it not be destroyed by the third generation. Thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to take questions at the panel discussion.